Okay, we're on. This is uh, different and difficult for me, but uh, I'm glad that I am able to uh, speak to all of you in this way. Uh, if this had happened a uh, hundred years ago, we would just be staying home. We're celebrating a special day today. And uh, this day, uh, which we call Palm Sunday, was the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem. And there were a lot of people that welcomed him into Jerusalem because they thought he was going to do something for them. And this is a day where we can look at what Jesus does as opposed to what we want him to do. He always surprises us. We're living in a difficult time, but when has there not been difficult times? Uh, 70 years ago, one of our favorite people, C.S. Lewis, that we like to quote, uh, said this about the day, days that he lived in, and that was the days of the atomic bomb. I remember uh, the latter part of this time where people were terrified of the atomic bomb. In fact, some of you might even remember uh, hearing people say, maybe we even said it ourselves, what are you thinking in bringing children into this horrible world? The world of the atomic bomb. Lewis said this, in one way we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age. I am tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death. Already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very we, uh, great advantage over our ancestors, that is anesthetics. But we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances, and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken, is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, or coronavirus, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled, huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs or coronavirus. They may break our bodies, a, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. Let's not let our minds be dominated. Let us not live in fear. But humanity has a basic desire for safety and security. That's part of our makeup. And God is planning to provide that for us in his way. But in order to do things our way, we have created this thing we call civilization. We have created government education, transportation, communication, modern medicine and science. All of these things are 
uh, good things uh, t to a certain point. They can become our idols, though. But once in a while, something comes along to remind us that all our human endeavors are fragile and frail and are going to fail. So we're in the midst of a plague, an ep epidemic, and all human institutions seem to be helpless. There's li little glimmers of hope. Modern medicine is a wonderful thing, and perhaps we will overcome this uh, in a very human way, or possibly not. We may conquer this illness and have another one far worse come in on its heels. We should be reminded of Abraham while his contemporaries were on the plain of Shinar were building their city, their institutions, their tower under the heavenly host, and building a name for themselves, God called Abraham to a different path. In Genesis 12, 1, it says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great. So while they were building this city on the plain of Shinar, God says to Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation. They're building their tower under the heavens. God, in effect, says to Abraham, I will be your God. I will lead you. And you don't need to make a name for yourself because I'm going to make your name great. And we come to a point where we need to ask ourselves a question. Are we going to do it our way, or are we going to follow God's leading, go his way? And we know how the story goes through Abraham, through Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes that went into Egypt, and they came out from their slavery in Egypt under Moses, and God established them in a land that he chose for them. He didn't say, just come out and go find some place to live. He said, go where I tell you to go, and this nation will be yours. And they built this nation, and they built a civilization under David and Solomon. And they began to think that they had done this by their own strength, by their own power, by their own merit. And of course, they built a temple, and they gave lip service to God. They performed sacrifices. They did the temple rites. Um, in some cases, they did most of the things that God asked them to do. Some of the things he told them to do, they never did. They never practiced the sabbatical year. They never practiced the year of Jubilee that they were told they should do. They never did that. And they began to decline. And the kingdom split, north and south. And eventually the north was taken into captivity under the Assyrians, and later the south was taken into captivity under Babylon. But through all this, God promised them a glorious future, that those promises never went away. Even in the midst of their moral decline, God promised them in Isaiah chapter 60, but in other places too, he says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. And the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar and your daughters will be carried in the arms, and then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. Getting to the part about this particular day, if you have a Bible handy, take a look at Luke chapter 19, 
And we're going to start in verse 28. Jesus had been ministering in Galilee for the past three years, maybe more than that. But he says in several places that he set his face toward Jerusalem. He knew he had something to accomplish in Jerusalem. And so he approaches the city. And it says after he said these things, he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he approached Bethphage and Bethany near the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? You shall say, The Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. In another place, it also says they put palm branches on the ground in, in front of him. That's why we call this Palm Sunday. And as soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen. And they're shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in, his, in the highest. They were, in effect, proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. They understood uh, how they were supposed to greet the Messiah when he came. They had been trained by the scriptures. Uh, they were rejoicing because of what they thought that Jesus was going to do for them, what they thought he was going to do for the nation of Israel, and that is to restore their former glory, bring about the promises. But Jesus had a different mission that day. They had been trained, though, from, the, from Psalm 118. They knew that this was how they were supposed to greet the Messiah when he came. This is the day. This is Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, or Hosanna. We beseech you, O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. See, they were hoping for prosperity, but he had something else in mind. But the psalm goes on, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They expected that he was going to enter the city, that he was going to set up, so to speak, in the royal residence, that he would banish the Romans somehow. But it says that when he went, approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side, and they will level you to the ground and your children within you because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Well, they had proclaimed him Messiah as he came in. But as judgments often happen in the scripture, it was already too late. Way back in Matthew 12, we see that the leaders of the nation of Israel had already proclaimed that he was not the Messiah, that his power came from the devil. And Jesus proclaimed the judgment upon them, what we call the unpardonable sin. There was another mission that Jesus had. 
something he had to accomplish first before he restored the glory of Israel. Way back in Genesis 22, we talked about this a few weeks ago, after Abraham took his son Isaac up to the mountain of Moriah and he was told to offer him as a sacrifice, the sacrifice that was cut short, Abraham recognized that the sacrifice was still required, that Isaac was an unworthy victim, but that God would provide in the future. Abraham in Genesis 22, 14 says, he called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. And this is Jesus' mission to go to Jerusalem, to that same place where Abraham and Isaac went, and to be the perfect victim, the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. But the people had forgotten. They, they knew some of their scripture. They knew the part that was exciting. They knew the part that you know, promised blessings. But they forgot the part about he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Jesus was on a different mission. All the way back to the time of Moses when he instituted the Passover, the Israelites were told, God told Moses, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of the month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Jesus was entering Jerusalem, not as the triumphant king, but as the Passover lamb on the very day, the tenth of Nisan. Jesus went on, and this is recorded in Matthew 23, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, a bunch of them had already said that. But he was speaking to the leaders of Israel. When you're ready to acknowledge me as the Messiah, then you will receive those temporal blessings. He told us ahead of time some of the things that were going to happen in the world before those blessings are realized. In Matthew 24, verse 5, he says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. And he said, You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened. Don't be frightened. For those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. But these are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Luke says that in addition to earthquakes, there will be plagues and famines and terrors and great signs in the heavens. Is this plague that we're experiencing now a biblical plague? I don't know. I can't tell you that. It might be. Luke tells us that there will be signs in sun and moon and stars on the earth, dismay among the nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things 
which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Unbelievers will be in terror. But Luke goes on. When these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing nigh. The more these things take place, these fearsome things take place, the closer we know we are to the redemption that he promised us. We need to put aside the fears of the world. We need to uh, embrace the tribulations that God is bringing upon this world. It's necessary. Uh, it's mainly necessary to encourage unbelievers to repent. As we read about these things in the book of Revelation, it seems like most of them will not, that they would rather take their idols into the cracks in the rocks and the caves and call upon the mountains to fall upon us rather than simply say, God's right, I'm wrong. But if we turn away from God, we are going to be in fear. We have a need for God. Augustine said this, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. Words for fearsome times and yet we can find our rest in Christ. Paul told uh, Titus in uh, chapter 2 verse 11, he says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. May peace be with you.